I'm teaching neuroscience at a business school. And this is unusual. There aren't that many of us professors who teach neuroscience to MBA students. And partially it's because we're getting closer to starting to use understandings of the brain to explain this moment that you all experience every now and then when you make a choice. So you can imagine yourself sitting in a supermarket by the shelf, there's Colgate on the left, Crest on the right, and you now have to choose which one you want, and your brain goes through a complex process. You assess the mintness of the one on the left, and the whitening on the right, and the price, and the package, and ultimately, you arrive at a choice. And you say, this is me. I know what I chose, what I chose. And what science shows us time and again is that you don't. That there's more things that go on in your brain that drive your choice that we cannot explain, and more so, if we ask you to explain, your answers are going to be, at best, incomplete. Because when we answer questions, when we try to explain our behavior, we usually answer questions not really how we are, but how we perceive ourselves. We answer questions about clothing, uh, as the skinnier version of ourselves. We uh, buy things for the healthier version of ourselves. We set alarm clocks at midnight for a person that's going to wake up and do all the things we have to do. But then when we wake up at 6 a.m., there's a different person out there. And then suddenly they don't want to do the same things that the other person. And we invented a button called Snooze that allows us to keep lying to ourselves time and again to make sure that we won't be true to ourselves. Now, the thing is, the answer that scientists arrive at in the last 10 years is that actually in our brain there are multiple people. There are multiple characters there that vie for dominance, and together they argue and they vote, and ultimately they come up with a conclusion that you only know of when it comes to you. And you have no idea that many things happened under the hood that none of them was accessible to you. And all we are is a mechanism that explains those choices after the fact. Now, this is hard to understand, and it was hard for me to understand. The first time it kind of made sense to me was when I went back and looked at my childhood and remember this game I used to play that kind of gave me a moment of clarity about the fact that we aren't always able to explain ourselves. This is a game that some of you who were raised in the 80s might know. You play this Italian plumber and you're trying to climb up the ladders and save your beloved princess while this vicious gorilla throws barrels at you. I, as a kid in the 80s, played this game in an arcade video game store for a while when suddenly two words appeared on the screen that changed my perception of control. The two words were insert coin. As it happens, I wasn't playing the game at all. I was watching a demo of the game playing itself for about 30 seconds, but I felt I was in control because for the most part, whatever I wanted to happen, happened. I wanted to go right and it went right. I wanted to jump and it jumped. Now, granted, there probably was a moment when I tried to go left and it went right, or I tried to jump and it didn't, but because for the most part, the intentions and reality aligned with my desires, I felt it was perfect. And this is a great analogy for life as it is right now. Things happen to this machine we call our body, and all our brain does is it comes up with an answer after the fact to tell our story. Now, this sounds kind of weird and hard to believe that there's many voices in my brain, but fortunately, in the last couple of years, we actually have all kinds of evidence to this crazy, insane uniqueness of us, which means that we are more than one. This example is one that I like a lot. It's a patient. It suffers from what we call split brain disorder, where essentially his parts of the brain aren't speaking to each other. When he's asked to solve a puzzle with his left arm, he has no problem, because the left arm speaks to the part of the brain that solves puzzles. He can do it easily. When he's asked to do the same thing with his right arm, he has a problem. The right arm in this guy's brain doesn't speak to the part of the brain that solves puzzles. So he just sits there and he's unable to do it. The same brain, just because we created a bridge between the two sides that doesn't let them speak to each other, means that now he cannot solve the puzzle. And you can see that the left hand actually knows the answer. It actually wants to help its friend because it knows the truth. It's just that we won't let him. And actually, if we do let him, if we say, you know what, use both hands, what you'll see is that there's actually a competition, an aggressive fight between the two sides of his brain fighting over this poor guy's control. Two sides that live in one brain and try to convince him that they know the answer. Now, we don't have to go as far as extreme cases like these patients who had a unique disorder that made them experience this 
competition in your brain, we can think of ourselves all the time. Many times in our life, a choice is made by our brain, and then if we move forward a little bit in time, we can't explain it anymore. We're going to come up with a different answer. The first time I saw it in real life with people like you and I, people not with unique disorders, is when I was in New York and I learned about a colleague of mine who ran this remarkable study that I had to replicate to see that it works. In this study, subjects come to the room, they're being asked to make a simple choice. You're seeing two cards with two people and we ask you to choose uh, if you find the person on the left or the person on the right more attractive. And people come and they see many, many of those cards and they make a choice. When they make a choice, they're given the card that they were uh, choosing and they have to explain to us why they chose the card they wanted. So imagine yourself sitting there, you see two people and you say, mm, I really like the guy on the left. We give you the card and you say, I like him because he's smiling. We say, fantastic, here's two new cards, this time two different people. You make a choice, you get the card, you explain. This is what you think the experiment is about. It's not. Because in one every now and then, one in every 20 trials, let's say, the person in the back, who isn't just a regular guy, but a magician, gives you the card you didn't pick. So if you pick the card on the left, he gives you the card on the right. First of all, people rarely notice that. If it's buried in many, many choices that are all insignificant, you might miss the fact that you got the card you didn't choose. But more interesting from our point of view is that you then go and explain the choice you made as if it was true. So think about it in the course of time. In time zero, you make a choice, you store it in your memory, and then you move on with your life. Five seconds later, we ask you to explain the choice. You don't really go to the beginning and you say, wait, what the choice I made was. You actually load the answer from your memory and you explain it. And if I change the story in your memory, you're going to come up with a different answer. You're going to explain to me something that wasn't there. And this is how life is all about. Imagine yourself in the context of a supermarket. You go shopping, you have a list of things, you put them in the basket, you made a choice. Colgate is the one you want. You put it in the basket and you go out to the checkout and somewhere between the moment you made the choice and the checkout, I sneak into your basket and I replace the Colgate with a crest. There's a chance that you won't notice this change and you will actually buy this thing. And if I stop you on the way out and I say, Yo, explain to me why you chose Crest, you're going to come up with a good, really, really plausible answer because your brain doesn't really know the truth. All it knows is the current moment and it explains it. Which means we can't really trust our brain in that sense. My students have this t-shirt that they made that allows us to remember that says, don't believe everything you think. And that is in a way where our brains are. There's characters in there making choices and all we are are people that explain the story. And this is amazing how good the brain is in kind of a story. This is a study from the 40s, very, very old study, where people were shown a simple cartoon like this. And you can see quickly how your brains immediately come up with a story. There's two people there, there's lovers, there's a bully, they're fighting. Our brain is really amazing in looking at realities and immediately explaining them. Because all it is, is a machine to get information and come up with some signal in the patterns. We bombard the brain with things and the brain learns to find meaning in it. This is what the brain is for. A machine to take complex worlds like the world we live in and find meaning in them. If you bombard your eyes with photons, you're going to call it seeing. If you bombard your ears with molecular vibrations, you're going to call it hearing. And the brain, over time, as your kids, learns to hear, to see, to interpret all kinds of information by the virtue of this machine that knows how to take complex meaning, information and find meaning. Now, if that's true, it means we can harness the brain to find meaning when it's not there and use it for our own purposes. In a study that was done now a number of years ago by a colleague of mine, Andrew Schwartz in University of Pittsburgh, they took monkeys and tied their right arm, putting electrodes in their brain and putting marshmallow in front of them. The brain speaks to a robotic arm, and when the monkey sees the marshmallow there, he tries to reach towards it, but his brain is connected to a machine instead of his arm, so he controls the robotic arm rather than his own biological one. For the first hours, the monkey tries to reach into the marshmallow but can't move his arm, so he just thinks the thought that would make it happen, and in doing so, just grab the marshmallow with the robotic arm. But here is the magic. After a few hours of trying to do just that, the brain learns that there's no more use for the biological arm connected to the brain and just reallocates resources to the point that now the monkey gets his arm untied. He can now go back to using it to actually get the marshmallow, but instead he actually scratches his head and uses the robotic arm to feed itself. The monkey in a few hours got a third arm. The brain learned that there's new signal coming to it the signal means something else, and from now on, we're going to allocate one resource to controlling the arm, another one to controlling this robotic biological machine. 
So in a few hours, the monkey learned how to take patterns of information and make meaning in them. And this is something that we can do all the time now. We can take brains, feed them information, and as long as information makes sense, the brain will learn how to make meaning. So think about flying. If we waited for nature to give us wings, it's going to take millions of years if it even is uh, uh, something uh, that's evolutionarily useful for us. But now that we know how to build wings, we can actually plug them to the brain and have your brain, the same way, within a few hours, learn how to control these flapping entities and maybe find ways to fly. We know how to build the machinery. Now the question is, can our brains automatically learn to harness the information and make it into something important? Now, we didn't build wings yet, but we can only start doing small things that demonstrate to us how the brain can do that. This project, which we call Human Version 2.0, means that we are now taking over evolution. And instead of waiting for it to do it its own speed, we're trying to see what we can add to the brain and have it do it its own way. So you can think of, for instance, uh, music in a different way. So instead of a drummer just playing with his own biological arm, we attach to his brain a controller that allows him to actually control our robotic arm and play drums even better in different paces. Or you can think, in many ways, of anything that you want to know that's out there connected to your brain. So when I fly tonight to New York, I'm going to need to know if I should wear a jacket or not. I get right now, go to Google uh, weather, and I look at the temperature, and it tells me 52, 64, 50. It doesn't really mean much to me. I have to go to my memory and recall a time where I felt this temperature. But when I get to New York, I'm actually going to feel it in my body, and my brain is going to interpret temperatures which means that if I can just connect my brain to a computer, I can right now, here in Chicago, turn off the machine and for a second not imagine what 64 would feel like, but actually feel it in my body. The brain's going to feel it, and I can just harness the brain's ability to change and manipulate information to make meaning. Think about your cars. When you drive your car and it gets empty, your fuel is almost running out, you just think about this garage and you say, OK, I need to get fuel. You don't really feel it. But I, what if I connect the car to your brain, and when you get too empty, you're actually going to feel hungry. This will be much easier to understand. Or maybe your stock portfolio, connecting this to your pain and pleasure centers. When it goes up, you're going to feel some pain, and you're going to know that something is going well. When it goes down, you're going to know that something is hurting in your back, and this is time to actually buy or sell stocks. The idea is that once we know how to read things from any monitor out there, and once we know that our brain can just get bits of information and make meaning out of them, we can use it to make anything we want. The interesting thing is that this will actually change our brains. It will make our brain think differently. This is a colleague of mine, a professor in Germany, who actually was born without his uh, hand. And being an engineer, he actually built his own robotic arm that he uses now to control things. But the thing about this guy, because his arm is controlled by his brain and it's a machine-based, he can do things he cannot do, like rotate his arm 360 degrees, which means that his brain can think thoughts that you cannot think. Like, I can put a light bulb in one movement. Right? You can just think that it's going to happen. All of those thoughts are not in your brain right now. And we are limited by our body in what we can think. The more we connect things to the brain, we can actually start thinking thoughts that aren't there. Now, this isn't just science fiction. All of those ideas of connecting the brain to machines outside was something that we tried in the brain. When we open patients' brain and we put stuff inside, we can now connect their brains to machines and have them play games with their brains. We can actually uh, connect them to cell cells that we can deactivate and make them forget memories or erase memories or change things. So we're now playing with this thing that used to be science fiction when I was starting grad school right now in the lab by putting things in the brain and seeing how they work. We can now connect a machinery that will actually make you see if you're blind because we override the eyes problems. We can have cochlear implants that override your, un, uh, f the, your faulty ears and actually plug straight to the brain and have the brain somehow in itself learn to hear because we just translate molecular vibrations to signal of the brain and it does its own thing. And the amazing thing is that basically we start to connect the brains to machines and getting access not just to the person who speaks for you, but also to the part of you that is dormant and isn't available to you, the part that makes choices. And finally, we can have those chips in your brain tell us more things about what you want. So I think we're entering an era where we're going to have better access to who you are, understand your choices better, but also can give you ways to operate in alignment with your desire rather than just in an obscure world where you make choices and explain them after the facts. Now, it's hard for us to grasp this idea that there's multiple people in our brain and that they vie for dominance and that we don't speak in the voice of what we call us and that we can change that. So I have an analogy that I want to end with. And this is an analogy for uh, 407 years ago. 
when in 1610 Galileo Galilei pointed his telescopes to the moon of Jupiter and he was expected to orbit in one direction, but it didn't align with his equations. He didn't find a ways to explain the equations, and the only way to actually solve it was to change the entire solar system's making, to put Earth as the third planet from the center and to put the sun in the center. And this, to him, felt like a dethronement of humankind. What does it mean that we're just one more planet out of many, not even the most important one, just one planet out of many that aren't even the center of the universe? But in the course of his accepting the equations, and in the 400 years that followed, we used this map of the solar system to see far out of what we saw before and to basically have access to the wide reaches of the universe. In the same way, we're in an era right now that we're beginning to see that we are not the most important voice in our own head, that there are many people there, and that we can actually put chips inside your head and get each of them to speak in their own language and maybe give you access to a lot more of what you thought you are. But this, to us, feels like an alarming thing. What does it mean that I'm not the most important voice in my own head? But in the same way, I think that once we accept the fact that neuroscientists now can explain our choices but giving voice to all the characters in there that together make us who we are, we'll understand the most interesting thing in the universe, which is us. Thank you. <laughs>